the building, it's a castle, I'm a boss. Better parliament the positive, I'm killing it, I'm iller than the plague, and never caught a cholera, a bala bala, on some cricket bowl of business while you're sitting in the bleachers. He was an actor who wrote poems and plays, and one time even teamed up with Doctor Who to fight alien witches or something. Close up this dinner, painful dying decay! Welcome to Watch Mojo's Top 5 Facts. In today's installment, we're counting down the five most fascinating facts about William Shakespeare. Y'all ready to get cultured? Right now! Number 5. Shakespeare has been translated into Klingon. That is the question. Shakespeare's Hamlet has been translated into at least 75 different languages, the strangest of which is probably Klingon. Is spelled with a or a Klingon Hamlet was originally published by the Klingon Language Institute and was translated as part of the Klingon Shakespeare Restoration Project. The book claims that Shakespeare was originally a Klingon, and his works have been shown on Earth in English as an elaborate piece of human propaganda. Number four, Shakespeare is responsible for the North American starling. Eugene Schieflin, a Shakespeare enthusiast from the late 19th century, tried to bring a bunch of birds to America that were referenced in Shakespeare's poems and plays. Schieflin's goal was to introduce every Shakespearean bird to America. Most of his releases were unsuccessful and sadly resulted in lots of dead birds. It's okay with some of these things happen all the time. The major exception to this was the starling, which really took to the new world. A little too well, even. In summer, they are iridescent purple-green with yellow beaks. In winter, they are brown with white spots and dark bills. There are currently around 200 million starlings in America, and it's become North America's most common songbird. Their huge numbers and voracious appetites have made them an invasive species. The New York Times once called them, quote, the costliest and most noxious birds on our continent. Number three, Macbeth isn't cursed, it's just popular. What about the unfortunate member of the audience who was struck by a prop during a fight scene, who suffered a massive heart attack and died on the spot? There's a history of accidents and death associated with the production of Macbeth that has led many to believe that it's cursed. This likely isn't true. A possible origin for the superstition comes from the fact that it was a surefire crowd pleaser. And so if a given play was failing, it could be canceled and replaced by Macbeth. The Queen, my lord is dead. So actors may have started to dread Macbeth because if it was being practiced nearby, they knew their show was about to be cancelled. Accidents have happened during the play, but it's likely because 1. There are a lot of fight scenes in the play, and 2. It has been staged literally millions of times in the past 400 years, so accidents were bound to happen. Yes, that's bullshit. Yes, that's so nice. Number 2. Contrary to popular belief, Shakespeare didn't coin all the words. He gave us handy words like eyeball, puppy dog, and anchovy, and more show-offy words like dauntless, besmirch, and lackluster. There's no doubt that Shakespeare's poetry was innovative, but some Anglophiles are way too enthusiastic when crediting him with inventing new words. Sometimes he's credited with the creation of as many as 3,300 new words. Of course, it's possible other people use these words first, but the dictionary writers liked looking them up in Shakespeare because there was more cross-dressing and people taking each other's eyes out. Digital technology has since dropped that number to under 1600, and it falls every year as more books become digitized and earlier usages are discovered. A lot of these coinages become less impressive when you realize that most of them are either existing words used in a new way, or words borrowed from other languages. But not all of them caught on. Here are some of the ones that didn't. See if you can put them into a sentence for me. Swaltery, quatch, quatch. Carlos. I've got a sweltery quatch at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> the number also shrinks dramatically when you look at the words that didn't catch on, like fustilarian, questrist, and flapdragon. I'm kind of disappointed flapdragon didn't catch on. Finally, the number might be even lower because Shakespeare wrote at a time when publishing was rare, and many books that he borrowed from didn't survive the centuries. <laughs> number one, Shakespeare works better than self-help books. He has a good fist for literary. Scientists at Liverpool University have been examining brain scans of people reading poetry to see what it does to the brain. They took a bunch of passages from Shakespeare and made people read them, then modernized the spelling and made them read it again. She helped me learn how to read. The simplified texts didn't do much for the brain, but they found that reading the original versions with all the olden words and strange metaphors made the parts of the brain that are associated with reappraisal mechanisms light up. 
This suggests that poetry makes you rethink your own life through the lens of what you've just read, and it does so far more effectively than reading self-help books. Basically, Shakespeare is the Elizabethan Dr. Phil, but that does not make Dr. Phil the modern Shakespeare. They don't want to stand up on national television and say, holy <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> so what do you think? Wouldst thou bite thy thumb at a saucy flap dragon? I would know. For more star-crossed top tens and wherefore art thou top fives, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. This do swear. This do swear. This do swear.